Welcome to the Wednesday program, July 11th, believe it or not, just two months away from 9-11, 11 years after 9-11, and we're working desperately to get some testing done, possibly uh, overseas in terms of World Trade Center debris. We will be reporting on you before 9-11 if that's possible, and we have some amazing reports. We didn't have a show last week with Harley Schlanger. He's back in Austria, and the meltdown of Europe continues at an ever-increasing pace. It's just literally uh, Ron Joy, the the uh, president of Spain is doing everything he can, being booed and jeered everywhere. The pigs' nations are collapsing, and uh, you have some important updates in terms of what's going on with some groups in Britain that basically have called for what you've called for, what I've called for for years now, is the Glass-Steagall to put a firewall between the uh, speculative economy and the real economy, which has not happened. Um, and unfortunately, the uh, side uh, that's supposedly opposing Obama the Republican Party chose a candidate who can't win, who can't win because, number one, he's not even a conservative Mormon. Uh, he doesn't uh, have a candidate pick that's pro-life, and his record is just horrendous dealing with the area of Obamacare because it, the template for Obamacare was his mandate in the Massachusetts health care, although he now he's, we should call him Flip Hananiah Romney. Uh, We've got a situation where now the lead has widened six points now for Obama's favor with a president who's the most incompetent, probably the lowest grade president we've ever had in the United States. Romney is so incompetent, it's his election to lose, and he's losing at a remarkable rate. He should get a star for losing. Well, let's let's get to the U.S. election in a minute, but let me start with the uh, earth-shaking events of the last ten days or so from Europe. Because what right. happened is you had this uh, conference that took place, the 20th Heads of State Conference in the last two and a half years, to deal with the collapsing euro. And they came up with a proposal, which is essentially what you and I have been talking about for quite a while, getting rid of national sovereignty and putting the nations of Europe under a bureaucratic dictatorship that would bail out the banks bail out the the corrupt and collapsing banks, but destroy the nations in which these banks operate. And this is the so-called European monetary, uh, or European stability mechanism, the ESM. Right. And this is essentially a bailout mechanism, which Geithner and Bernanke pledged $2 trillion to back. Now, they've got to bail out $9 trillion of European bank debt. Now, the total sum of European sovereign debt is about $3.2 trillion. So when people say it's a crisis of the Greeks spending too much, the Spanish spending too much, the Italians spending too much, well, maybe they spend more than they're taking in right now, but that's because of another factor. But... It's only one-third of the total amount that needs to be bailed out in the banks under the European Union policy. Now, LaRouche's policy was go with Glass-Steagall right now and let the banksters eat their bad paper. But no government should bail them out, neither our government or any central bank. No one should bail out these banks that have gambled and lost trillions of dollars because the nine trillion they need in recapitalization is a pittance for the hundreds of trillions in obligations they've run up with their derivative gambling. Right. They had this event the 28th and 29th of June in Brussels where they said okay now we've solved everything we're going to get this new European stability mechanism in place and at the, at just at that moment the story came out in Britain actually on July 1st about something that people have known and suspected about the LIBOR, the London Interbank Offered Rate, which is the supposedly benchmark of interest rates. But what came out is that not only has this been manipulated to make money for the banks and to make the banks look more solvent than they are, but that the U.S. Federal Reserve knew about this in 2007, 2008. They even had Jim meetings. Geithner, I think they had, I think they had eight meetings, and Jim Geithner was involved, and many others who tried to lie later and said they didn't. Right. Yeah, and Geithner personally, at the head of the New York Fed, was involved in attempting in September 2008 to work out an arrangement by which Barclays, which is at the center of the scandal, was going to bail out Lehman Brothers. So Geithner certainly knew 
what the situation was. The Bank of England knew it. And so all of a sudden, overnight, the London Financial Times, which is the largest or most important of the free market financial press, came out and said, we were wrong to say we support Vickers' ring-fencing policy. The ring-fencing policy is essentially keep the too-big-to-fail banks, but just let them do more internal policing. Instead, the Financial Times said we should instead go with the Glass-Steagall of Franklin Roosevelt. Right. And this was backed up by Peter Hambros of Hambros Bank, one of the more important of the smaller private banks. It was backed up by a guy named Boodle from uh, Capital Enterprises, one of the leading hedge funds in, in England. A whole series of top British lords and, and others are now coming out calling for Glass-Steagall. Now, we haven't won the fight yet, because in the United States, Obama is still the president, and Obama is opposed to Glass-Steagall, and for that matter, so is Mitt Romney and so is Ron Paul. They're all opposed to Glass-Steagall. They want the banks to get bailed out. But if we want to stop the bailouts, Glass-Steagall is the shortcut to do it. Right, and what will happen, too, is that you'll see the springs pop off the little robot of Obama, and he will become completely in, un, uncontrollable. Uh, at that point, you'll see Obama do things that will make him absolutely essential for him to be impeached. Because once they put this credit wall up, the British banking system, which is totally backing Obama, the Rothschild banks, etc., they will, uh, will try to pull every string possible to get Obama to bail them out. Well, actually, there's an interesting twist in this whole thing, which is that a couple people associated with the Rothschild banks are among those talking about Glass-Steagall. Now, there's a reason for that, which is that they realize that this euro crisis and the bailout crisis will not only destroy the banking system or destroy the countries they want to destroy, but will destroy them as well. And so some of them are doing the same thing that leading Brits did in 1901-1902 when they saw World War I coming. And they said, well, we keep, we've been talking free trade all these years. We're now going to go to a Hamiltonian policy for a decade or so to rebuild our economy so we can fight World War I. So periodically the Brits jump away from their imperial policies and go with something on the basis of survival. But they don't do it for the good of mankind. We need Glass-Steagall not to defend a few British banks, but for the good of mankind. Yeah, exactly. Now, well, we can well, what's likely use to, them to get it through. Now, what's happening is they're now trying to push, uh, literally this summer, in the next few weeks, that the only alternative to the economic, I uh, call it economic Eden, of Europe, which will also tear down the American banks and also cause a massive devaluation of the U.S. dollar and a bank holiday in America as well which, of course, Obama is just waiting for. He'd love to have an October surprise like that. The only alternative is a federated Europe, where basically there's no states anymore. The yeah. states have no financial power. And, of course, people don't realize there's only two things that legislations do. They, they handle money. They decide on taxes and how it's going to be dispersed. And they make laws and rules so people don't harm each other. Beyond that, basically, other than infrastructure and, you know, funding, the legislature will become vested. What's likely to happen in Europe? We'll have a Europe-wide army. We'll have a Europe-wide financial and federated system. The uh, credit system they're going to use will be primarily the U.S. Fed, which, by the way, and five of the six for nothing but bailouts. But even that is breaking down. We saw the German Constitutional Court yesterday refuse to endorse the European Stability Mechanism exactly. and put a three-month hold on it. Wait, well, that, in fact, even if Merkel wanted to do it, which she doesn't. She can't, and the courts have basically said, Germany, you can't do this, even if you want to do it. It's, it's, yeah, so in other words, we're going to see a meltdown in Europe. Up, in other words. <laughs> yeah, so, so the, the gears of the machine are grinding to a very, very screeching halt as we speak in this very hot summer of 2012. Back in a moment.
Welcome back, and uh, Harley, let's jump into some of these topics. Um, yeah. Lots and lots of issues to, to talk about. I want to just hit the, the headlines, and then I'll let you kind of expand on them, because sure. we've got quite a few things to cover today. Uh, let's start off with the top. We talked already about the bridge, the, a group of people in Britain, these organizations, some of them bad guys, bad guy banks, but to save themselves, they want Glass-Steagall. Then, of course, we have uh, the... Um, Issue of uh, Helga Zepp La Roche, uh, which is La Roche's wife, and Jacques Chaminade, and they had a webcast. Uh, Nicholas Biddle and the Second National Bank. Uh, we want to talk about that credit versus speculation. And the fact is, we have a speculative system now that's basically like uh, turning on uh, everything into Las Vegas. The entire world financial system should not be Las Vegas, where only the host wins, which is the Rothschild bankers, and every economy literally collapses and the nation states disappear. And destroys the middle class, private property, uh, and any economy. And of course, the LIBOR thing is really opening wide now. The fact that uh, Barclays came out uh, is really pretty remarkable, but the fact that, that now we have the evidence that went back to 2007 and that Geithner and these other characters knew in advance, and the Bank of New York keeps coming up. In fact, we discussed this the other day on Black 9 11 with Mark Gaffney that the Bank of New York was in, intimately involved with 9 11 as well and was money laundering. So we know that the Fed and Bank of New York were doing all kinds of, of evil things, dealing with the LIBOR, etc. Then we have, of course, the world wheat crop is uh, wiped out. It wiped out in Argentina and, uh, and, and uh, Chile. Uh, we're also seeing a collapse of the uh, of corn crop here in America. It's basically, unless there's a major turn of, of uh, the climate, we're going to see a uh, famine, and the price of commodities is going to go through the ceiling. Um, so let's open up some of these topics. And, of course, then we also have Putin and his uh, continued work. We now have China and Russia coming and saying they support the, uh, the Kofi Annan plan, uh, but also want to include Iran. And, of course, the United States and Britain say, what do you mean you're going to include Iran? Of course, they're parties to the support for the state of Syria. And uh, you can't have a negotiation where you say the, uh, in order for us to negotiate, we have to have the other party, you know, deposed. It, it, this, this so-called the Syrian National Army is the is precondition is that you surrender. Yeah, you must give up. Yeah. yeah, that's that's ridiculous. It's not going to happen. So, what realistically well, let, let, is going to happen right, here? Let's go back so, to the, the situation in Europe because of the the statements Mr. Larouche made. The, the easiest yeah. way to understand this is that what the EU has come down to is that the rate of bailout cannot keep up with the rate of increased debt. So right. that even if they go with a total unleashing of printing presses, computers, whatever they do, they still can't cover the debts that are coming due. Right. And so this was clear in the case of Spain, in the case of Italy, it's clear in the case of Greece, but also France. The only country that can handle this is Germany. And if you stick Germany with having to come up with three to four trillion uh, dollars, there's no way the German economy would survive. Right. So this is what forced some of these people in Great Britain to say, look, we're all going to get wiped away in a tidal wave of debt, foreclosure, implosion, and hyperinflation. So for the sake of our families in the future, we have to step back from the brink right now. Now, there are people, as you know, in the British uh, aristocracy who are willing to go over the brink. They're willing to see chaos and, and uh, famine and depopulation. That's the crowd that's around Prince Philip and, and the Queen. Uh, it includes a, a very significant grouping in insurance companies and so on. They're willing to let the whole thing blow out. But some of the ones who are more cunning, to use a word you used on the break, uh, like the Rothschilds, are basically saying, for us to survive, we're going to have to do something that in the short term will be good for the nations. But if we survive, we'll be able to figure out how to live with it. Uh, we're not going to lose power, and we're not going to let humanity be destroyed completely. Now, I'm not endorsing the Rothschilds by saying this. I'm just saying they didn't maintain their power for 200 years by being stupid. They're, they're fairly clever. And so right. this is the grouping that said you can't have bigger bailouts uh, than or the bigger debt growth than the bailouts you're doing. It doesn't work. Right. So what they did is they used the scandal of LIBOR. Now, the scandal of LIBOR exists on two levels. 
the first level is just the the one that was initially exposed, which is that the banks were lying in 2008 about how much they had to pay to borrow money, because if they reported that their the rates they were paying were going higher, it would make it clear that they were in financial trouble. So they were putting out lying figures to make themselves look better. But that's really just a small part of it, because they couldn't get credit anyway, because remember the credit crunch in 2007, 2008? So they only survived in that period, uh, Barclays, Royal Bank of Scotland, and Lloyd's, by a secret bailout fund of 60 billion pounds from the Bank of England. But once they found they could get away with manipulating the LIBOR, what they said is, Let's turn this over to our trading offices and let them figure out how to use this to manipulate interest rate swaps, the so-called credit default swaps, uh, and then generally use the lying about the rates to do in-house trading to make super profits based on knowing which way these things are going to go, because they're the ones setting them. So it's the classic case of insider trading. And now we're not talking about merely looking solvent and something like a 60 billion pound bailout. Now we're talking about hundreds of trillions of dollars in derivatives in which the house, to use your example earlier, the house knows which way the interest rates are going to go so they won't lose, but they would sell bets on both sides so they would cheat some of their clients even while they made money from the inside information. Yeah, well, this is happening for years now. And now it's come out, it shows how dirty the system is. And well, there was nobody I watching that. Geithner the... and Bernanke were involved in. Geithner right. directly at the New York Fed. It's not just the Bank of New York. It's, it's Citibank. It's, it's uh, J.P. Morgan Chase and especially Bank of America that were involved in doing this. Well, all the same banks, by the way, that are asking with their handout for tons more money. Well, and these were all the banks that were involved initially in the TARP these are also the banks that were tied to the scandal of the London Derivatives Office of AIG. They were basically getting money laundered through AIG back to them to pay them for their bad debts in 2007, 2008. Uh, I mean, this thing is, is, now we're talking about trillions of dollars. And I know the American people to some extent are jaded with the stories of uh, corruption and fraud, but don't be jaded. Get your back up and do something about it. We're talking about people who have lost homes. There are people who have committed suicide, people who have been cut off from medical care, while these criminals stole and looted and lied. Yeah, I know. Amazing. And while this is going on, they are shoving Obamacare down our throat. The National Defense Authorization Act is wending its way through the uh, Congress. Obama is planning on the 27th of July, this next two weeks, to sign the International United Nations Treaty on Small Arms and threatening the Senate to ratify it. Back in a moment. They want disaster. Welcome back, and Harley, you've got some important topics to, to expand upon. Let's continue, please. Well, I, I want to report what happened yesterday in the German Constitutional Court because, you know, people get cynical about Supreme Courts and, and courtrooms, and we've seen so much corruption there, including the really insane ruling to uh, allow Obamacare to go ahead. Yeah, I know. Uh, Judge Roberts, basically, we've analyzed We try to give him credit. There's no credit. Judge Roberts is just interested in trying to make a, a, a name for himself, like a lot of the politicians trying to stuff their pockets in, in what I call the district of criminals. Well, what we have is a situation, at least the German courts uh, stood up for some principle, didn't they? Well, and, and one other point, just to go back to the, this question of the courts, the Republicans who are trying to repeal Obamacare, for some reason, won't bring up the Independent Payment Advisory Board which truly is a death panel model on what Hitler did to kill the so-called useless eaters. It's a, so, a genesis, eugenics on demand, and basically yeah. even if you carry really good insurance, if you're a certain age, you're referred to an ethics committee, and we know that uh, up to 40% of doctors, this is a reasonable figure, some of them are re of the reports are high as 80%, but at least 40% of doctors will quit with implementation of uh, Obamacare, 40%. Well, and, and what you have is, is legitimately something which is a death panel which is going to say that 
certain people are in categories which are not going to be treated. Well, let's and put it this way. If somebody was going to kill my relative, I'm going to show up with a, a battalion of attorneys and dictaphones at the hospital, and many of those, those attorneys will also be MD, JDs, and then if that doesn't work, I'm going to show up with special forces. How's that? <laughs> Well, let, let's go back to the constitutional remedy first, because that's what I, I don't want people to be too cynical about this. What happened in Germany is that there were four or five cases brought previously uh, to argue that the Grundgesetz, which is the basic law of Germany, the Constitution of Germany, was being violated by these treaties, which essentially said that bureaucrats in Brussels and not the elected government in Berlin would be determining economic policy. Now, the Germans were, seemed to be willing to let that happen to the Greeks, maybe the Spanish, but when it was clear that this was meant for a European-wide, all 27-member nation uh, bureaucracy that would, would dictate policies, and they would be the policies of the bankers, uh, over 200 German economists signed a letter denouncing this. Uh, there were eight cases brought before the Constitutional Court, and the government represented by the finance minister Schäuble came in and said, look, you can't uh, have an injunction against the European stability mechanism. That will hurt the euro. And one of the professors argued there are things more important than the euro. And that's important because a professor basically said the future of a nation under law is more important than balancing the books uh, of, of a banker, especially when we know now that the bankers lie with their books. So the German court said this is an important enough issue that we're going to need as much as three months, which means that the European Stability Mechanism, which was supposed to come in at the end of this month, because they need the bailouts by July 31st, may be postponed through September. Now, if that's the case, banks in Europe will start blowing out. So what it means is the fact that the courts and also the regulatory authorities in Britain told the truth about Barclays and LIBOR now means in the United States we have an opportunity to do something. Because the British, by saying they're considering Glass-Steagall, are really throwing the ball back in our court. Glass-Steagall is an American law. It's not a British law. And so the question is we have 70 sponsors of a Glass-Steagall resolution in the U.S. House of Representatives. We don't have a single sponsor in the Senate. We, we should have 435 sponsors in the House. So your listeners have a job to do. If the British were to go with Glass-Steagall and the U.S. did at the same time, we would use it to wipe out the speculative debt. Now, it would mean the banks would remain, but they would probably have to be put under new ownership because the existing owners will have been shown to have committed crimes, as in the case of Barclays, Royal Bank of Scotland, Citibank, J.P. Morgan Chase, and others. And so un under a uh, Glass-Steagall regulatory reorganization, we would have banks that would actually serve the interests of a community. That means actually make loans to people who are going to set up job-creating businesses, as opposed to having banks that collect large amounts of money from central banks, unlawful private banks like the Federal Reserve, and use that to back up their worthless, toxic assets in the tune of hundreds of trillions of dollars. So either the bankers will continue to run things with a hyperinflation that will starve many, many, many people, or we're going to get Glass-Steagall. And I need your listeners to get on the horn and tell people about this, to go to LaRouchePack.com and read the damn story. Get the story straight. And then go down to your congressman's office and knock on their door and go in and tell the aide you're not leaving until you find out where he stands on Glass-Steagall. Right, because the Glass-Steagall issue, unless it's done, in fact, if it was done before the election, we would probably have 
a response by Obama that would result in his impeachment. And ideally, this should happen immediately because they're going to have their their congressional meeting, uh, their, their presidential meetings in next month, both for the Republicans and Democrats. And Obama should have already been on his way out. They should have been selecting another candidate. It, it has and the Repu- to happen immediately. Right. And the Absolutely other thing is right. that the Republicans basically made a very big mistake choosing Romney. Romney yeah. is another version of Kerry, John Kerry in 2004. And I see the same thing happening. Now the lead is expanded by Obama. Obama should be down by 6 to 10 points. Instead, he's ahead 6 points now. And with the bounce caused by the Supreme Court saying, yeah, it's, uh, it's legal, we can tax you. The American public are just rolling over like a puppy. Rub my tummy. Yes, you're boss. Yes, you're the Fuhrer. I mean, it's really scary that the American public is responding in this way. This is not smart on the part of the public at all, is it? No, and, and not voting is not an option. The point is we've got to get candidates who are worth fighting for. And the only thing these two candidates are worth is fighting against and throwing them both out before the conventions. Right. There are uh, yeah. many, many people. For example, I've been doing some work on some... Uh, uh, with some Ron Paul websites and libertarian websites. These are people who are angry. They're angry because they know Romney's no damn good, but they saw Ron Paul essentially capitulate. And so they're saying, well, what do we do? What's our option? Well, help us get Obama out. If we could get 20 Republicans to join uh, a bunch of Democrats to move against Obama, we could remove them. And I'm not talking about impeachment. I'm talking about the way Nixon was removed. You send in senior figures who go into the office and say, Mr. President, you're probably going to end up in jail if you stay in office. Instead, we're going to give you a dignified way out. We're going to stick you in a helicopter and get you the hell out of town. And that could be done. You know, in fact, there was a a bit of a trial balloon with Jimmy Carter writing an op-ed in the New York Times, essentially declaring Obama a war criminal. Did you see that? Uh, no, I didn't, actually. That's, that's, uh, that's really funny. This was based on the drone attacks and the, the uh, assassinations and Obama violating due process. Carter never once mentioned Obama, but this is the same newspaper that identified Obama as the drone killer. And what Carter said is that these attacks in the Pakistan, Yemen, and elsewhere are human rights violations that are defined as war crimes by the U.N., Now, here's an irony. Carter's a Nobel Peace Prize winner, as is Obama. Carter is saying Obama should also be brought before the International Criminal Court on human rights violations and murder. And that's very strong. And I really have to say that in spite of all the problems Jimmy Carter has, it took some guts for him to do that. And there should be others in the Democratic Party who will now step forward. He wouldn't have done that without knowing that that's a point of view of at least a handful of senior Democrats. Exactly, yeah. Now, we don't have very many options left. The time is really getting short. This election, we cannot stand another four years of Obama. It will become the USSA, the United Soviet States of America. And the states will basically be bankrupt and now be vassals of a federalized government that will be just simply operating as a tax letter for global government. That's what will happen. You had an important uh, statement here. I talked about this analogy that uh, the bankers in Europe, primarily the, 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 the Germans, basically were in a sense loaning money to these other pigs nations, which, you know, Portugal, Italy, Greece, uh, and Spain, and saying it's like the ice cream shop on the beach. Uh, you can't buy more than 3% ice cream at the front door, but the back door you can come around, we'll loan you the money to buy more ice cream so you can fund your social programs and you can go into the great debt. And eventually they say, I'm sorry, no more ice cream for you, just like the soup Nazi on uh, Seinfeld. Only now we want you to pay off the debt plus unbelievable interest. And by the way, we've accumulated extra debt. 
through our speculative banking because we don't have a wall between speculative banking and real economy and you have to pay our debts as well and so we want your nation to pay the debts of our banks in your country as part of the deal to pay for your ice cream well the only disagreement i would have with you on that is that it's not the german bankers who came up with this came no i know it wasn't germany it was it was the london the bankers germans, yeah the germans it, were brought into it they brought into it later, but I mean, I use that analogy, but it was primarily sure. the London bankers. And of course, the same group, or the group like the Carlisle Group, LIBOR, uh, Larry Greenberg, uh, the Blackstone Group, the same people involved, by the way, with 9-11, the Bank of New York was a Fed. These are the same players who were involved in 9-11. In fact, if you want to look at the 2008 financial collapse, the, which was derivatives invented by George Soros, this whole scheme was hatched at 9-11. This is not something recent. This is now 11 years old. This is a ongoing cancer now metastasizing it, it actually, through the economy. It, it actually goes back to uh, the fall of communism in 1989-1990. Exactly. The British said to the Germans, and they were backed by the French and the United States, Bush Sr., that Germany could not, would not be allowed to reunify unless they accepted the euro. But they exactly. were told at the beginning it would not be a transfer union. In other words, Germany would not have to transfer wealth to other countries to allow them to develop. But of course that's all it ever was because it was never based on an effort to build the economies of Southern Europe. It was to build the debt of the economies of Southern Europe. Now, the key guy in this is someone named Robert Mundell. And Mundell is an oligarch. He, had, he bought a castle in uh, Northern Italy and he just had a conference there which is probably more significant than the Bilderberg Conference because it's smaller in terms of numbers, but they're all top-level international bankers. And what Mundell has admitted, and he's been open about this for years, is that the whole purpose of the euro was to fail, but in the process of failing, force the, the uh, giving up of sovereignty by the nations of Europe. And the reason he wanted to do that is that Giving up sovereignty would mean no more social programs, no more retirement funds, no more health care. Essentially, these kinds of needs that people have get in the way of the banker's short-term profit. Right. And so what Mundell and others really want to go back to is a pre-1648 slave society. 1648 yeah. was the Peace of Westphalia, where right. the, the end of the Thirty Years' Religious War was based on recognizing the interest of the other, including the interest to a sovereign state. And our American Revolution was a product of that, that kind of ruling imposed by Cardinal Mazarin of France. Uh, so the idea of the sovereign nation state has been essential for the development of our nation, and other nations copied it in the late 19th century to become modern sovereign nations. Mundell and others said, we don't need sovereignty. Sovereign nations get in the way of international bankers' ability to make a profit. Uh, minimum wage is unacceptable. Uh, loaning to small business is unacceptable. We should have cartels running everything. That's what Mundell believes in. Now, one of the people who is at his castle for this conference, in fact, there's a video of him playing ping pong, Mundell and Paul Volcker. And Volcker was the guy who was deployed to make sure Dodd-Frank was passed, so it would not include Glass-Steagall. Volcker is the guy who's currently telling Democratic congressmen, don't go along with LaRouche because LaRouche wants to punish bankers, and Dodd-Frank will not punish bankers. Now, this is a war, as I said before the last break, between bankers who want to destroy your life by destroying the only protection we have, which is a constitutional republic. But they also are doing this against other republics like Egypt, Syria, etc. In yeah. fact, they have a constitutional crisis now in Egypt where the president is trying to violate even the courts that have said that there were such irregularities in the election that the election is called off and nullified and they have to call new elections. And yet he's calling forward against the military who backed the courts to say this is illegal. And on, and on top of that, we have... U.S. Vice, U.S. President George, uh, Obama and I call the usurper in chief 
and Hillary Rotten Clinton calling for the fall for basically regime change, which is against the tree, the literally the, the uh, charter it's for the NATO. Charter. It's against the Nuremberg Tribunal, and it's yeah. against our own Constitution. George right. Washington, who, if there's anybody who knew what our Constitution said, basically warned us against choosing leaders in foreign countries when he yeah. talked about not getting involved in uh, foreign policies and foreign countries, policy of foreign countries. Yeah. And what we see under Obama, which is a continuation of the neocons who ran George W. Bush, uh, and what would be a continuation either under a second term of Obama or a Romney administration, would be the end of the sovereignty of any nation on the planet. Well, we so have a situation now... We have a situation now with with the U.S. and this came out 40 minutes ago from Reuters that the White House says Iran's role with Syria is quote not productive. I mean, what kind of a statement is that? Not productive? Was it productive for a nation, America, many thousands of miles away, to just call for regime change and say that their main ally, Iran, has no point, no place in actually discussions of peace when it really is a well, Sunni Shiite war? What That's what it is. A Sunni Shiite war is what is going on. What we're dealing with, as Larouche pointed out in April 2009 is a Nero Hitler narcissistic personality in Barack Obama. And we cannot allow an election to take place in November between Obama and Romney. Obama right. has to be removed by constitutional basis before then, based on the crimes he's committed as President of the United States. And that's the only way we're going to uh, solve this. Well, let's put it, put it this way. Uh, two years from now, if Obama gets in, if I say the things I say right now on the radio, I'll be jailed and or executed under Obama. Well, and, and here's the point. This new development around Glass-Steagall, as Lynn has said, LaRouche has said for quite a while, Glass-Steagall is the tipping point. You take the power away from the so-called too-big-to-fail banks, the universal banks. You put the power back in the hands of the Congress. Yes, the Congress right now is a bunch of gutless bums. But if they see us as a population moving to throw out Obama and going back to the principles of a regulated banking system so that they're no longer going to be queuing up to Wall Street to get money to run for re-election, they'll have to pay attention to the people. It's the only hope we've got to restore our nation to its tradition as a constitutional republic. Yeah. Yeah, so so we and we have the situation where we have this happening parallel to the Western to NATO and the United Nations pushing for a Middle Eastern war that'll clamp off the oil supplies from Iran and the Strait of Hormuz. We have the uh, the United Nations and and the Western powers doing nothing to stop the ecological disaster of Fukushima. Which, by the way, the amount of radiation release we will have subacute radiation sickness in North America and in Europe. If this blows, as I expect very shortly, they got lost the uninterruptible power supply. They nearly hit critical temperature last Tuesday, where the reactor cooling pool for <coughs> fuel rod assemblies, 1,535 of them were ready to blow. I'm doing the keynote lecture October 3rd to 7th at the American Academy of Environmental Medicine on Fukushima, and uh, talks also on and a presentation on Macondo at the British Petroleum on the effect on the CNS and the mitochondria of people worldwide uh, for the Academy. And I can tell you right now what's going on. This ecological disaster will cause Japan to have a massive actuation, a collapse of their economy, and they're the only credit economy buying this bad debt, which means well, Europe's going to be... Go to LaRouchePack.com to get the, the solution, the story of Glass-Steagall. Exactly. And those are solutions that need to be implemented immediately. We need to have impeachment of Obama, Glass-Steagall. We need to replace Romney as the so-called Republican candidate. He can't win against Obama. He is so incompetent in his team. And they won't even announce who the vice president, although his wife has suggested maybe a woman. Well, maybe, God knows, Sarah Palin showing back up, resurrected from the dead by uh, uh, none other than uh, Kissinger, who selected it. He said he's, he's her girl. Who knows? Talk to you next week. Absolutely amazing.